Thank you so much. What, um, what MJ um, found out after we met is that I have deep ties to Baltimore and to the University of Maryland. Um, my grandfather, Frank Figge, actually came west from Colorado to attend medical school here and was a faculty member. He um, started the anatomy lab um, and, uh, and also uh, did cancer research. My grandmother was a Goucher College graduate and helped him manage his lab. And um, typical of women of her generation, um, she was essentially his editor, co-author, lab manager, and uh, had no credit. Um, but that was okay with her. She um, was an amazing woman. And I'll tell one story. Um, when I started working um, for US News, helping them to start their website in 1995, I brought my laptop over here to Towson, where my grandmother lived. She was 85 years old at the time. And um, I was showing her the web, and um, she was leaning forward, peering at the screen, and didn't seem to re be reacting. And um, this is a woman who um, pursued information like it was a contact sport. <laughs> she was somebody who had CB radio in the 70s and a Mac in the 80s, and I thought for sure that she would love the idea of the World Wide Web. Um, but I felt like I wasn't reaching her and um, until she slumped back in her chair and said, I was born too soon. Because she immediately grasped what the internet was going to mean for all of us. And again, this was 1995. This was, you know, very early days. And she, and she got it. Um, but she wasn't born too soon. She actually lived uh, another decade and was a daily internet user. Um, and her last words before she passed away um, were, erase my email. <laughs> yeah. um, so this is, this is the context that I bring to you, that, that um, uh, the University of Maryland Baltimore has, has such a, an important role to play, um, as we all do. And um, even if you meet people, even if you yourself are still not quite sure that um, this can really make a difference in healthcare, um, think about my grandmother um, and think about the way that um, this can be used in, in new ways that, that we can't even tell yet. Um, sometimes I call myself an internet geologist because uh, the Pew Research Center collects data about the online landscape, and we need to stay alert to, to changes. We spent uh, probably the first five years just mapping the landscape, understanding who's online, who's not online, um, finding out that eight and 10 internet users uh, were going online for health information. That was back when only 46% of US adults had access to the internet. Um, now we're up near ubiquity around 85%, and it's still eight and 10, so the pie's gotten bigger, but the slice um, has remained the same. Um, and so when I talk about being an internet geologist, um, in around 2008, we started noticing how many people were adopting mobile technologies. Um, and I'll get to the data in a minute. But um, the way I started thinking about mobile is that I started describing it as an earthquake. Um, and um, because I really did see it disrupting so many different industries, not just healthcare, but any industry that you can think of has been disrupted and continues to be disrupted by mobile. But I realized that the metaphor of an earthquake is um, not necessarily accurate because an earthquake destroys things. Um, and this is a disruption that I see actually opening new passes through mountains. Um, and um, I, you know, as I was traveling here from DC this morning, I again was thinking about my grandfather coming here um, from Colorado and, and thinking about how maybe mobile is better thought of as an earthquake that creates new roads through impassable mountains. Um, and so um, what I'd love to do today is lay out all the data to show you, to prove to you, give you the evidence that this, it really is changing the landscape um, both in terms of technology and in terms of health communication. Um, and what I wanted to say is that as <coughs> we start to recognize these new roads through these old impassable mountains, um, we need to find the locals. 
they know the path of the mountain. Um, so again, maybe a metaphor is we need to find Sacagawea again and follow her. But this time, let's respect the landscape and let's respect the people that we meet as we go through the mountains. Um, so let's start with the data. This is a slide that indeed we just updated to show the, the new number, 35% um, have a tablet computer. And that reflects actually um, uh, Americans age 16 and older. Most of our data focuses on the adult population 18 and older, uh, but that particular survey um, looks at 16 and older. As you start to sort of decipher the slide, I'll, I'll start talking a little bit about that timeline, that 91%. Um, which represents the percentage of American adults who own a cell phone. Um, the important thing to remember about cell phones um, is indeed how not only are they ubiquitous, nearly ubiquitous, but people keep them close. They're very personal objects. They're, um, they almost have sort of a magical quality, the way people want to be near them. Um, and we collected some data about this. 67% of cell phone owners say they find themselves checking their phone for messages, alerts, or calls, even when they don't notice their phone ringing or vibrating. They just keep hoping for that connection. 44% of cell owners have slept with their phone next to their bed because they wanted to make sure they didn't miss any calls, text messages, or other updates during the night. And 29% of cell owners describe their phones as something they can't imagine living without. So in terms of how this can be used for health, um, I uh, had a blog post about a year ago that generated a wonderful comment thread. Um, and it was just focused on text messaging and what are the interventions that can be used for text messaging. Um, and one of the examples shared was um, actually the VA um, had an emergency um, crisis line um, via text. Um, and it was so successful that they were overwhelmed, but they feel that, that it has been able to prevent suicide um, in our veterans. Um, there's a medic mobile pilot in India, um, which uses text messaging to reach mothers for um, vaccination reminders. And it's yielded a 20% improvement in childhood vaccination rates. Um, and that's an absolute number. 20% um, increase. Um, the, my favorite example is, was a pilot that was done um, among teenagers who are living with chronic conditions. And as you might know, um, it's very difficult for, um, for teenagers who are making the transition from pediatric care to adult care. And they're also making that difficult transition to, to becoming adults and trying to take responsibility for their health. Um, and yet, they're teenagers. Um, and, and so um, what sometimes happens is that they rebel by, by pushing away their diagnosis, by pushing away um, the, the idea that they need these medications. Um, and so a group of researchers um, gave uh, iPhones to um, teenagers with chronic conditions who needed to take daily medication. And the teenagers agreed to allow um, the researchers to monitor the content of their text messages and their music choices so that they could tell when, their, when the teenager's mood was dipping. And it would trigger an automatic reminder to take their meds because they had noticed that when the teenager's mood dips, they are less likely to stay on their meds. This is not a reminder that has anything to do with mom. This is not a nagging thing that, that a parent is gonna do. This is honoring the relationship between the clinician who knows that you need to take your meds and the teenager who really deep down knows that they need to be responsible. Um, and so this is one of those um, real world problems that I think that um, holds promise for us all. Um, and I was really struck by a comment by Ronnie Zeiger um, he used to run Google Health, and he's now at a um, startup called Smart Patients. And his comment on this thread about mobile health was, we need to focus on real people's problems being solved in a way that works for them. And so again, I'm gonna go into a lot of data today, but let's think about the context 
um, within people's lives. So the next slide shows um, the rise of the mobile internet. And this is very, very important um, to again see. Um, you know, it was around 2008 that I started describing mobile as an earthquake. And now we can really see that it's, it's beyond earthquake proportions. This is really a new civilization that's being built. Um, what's important about um, this data is um, that people who are um, cell mostly internet <coughs> users comprise um, a, a little bit of a different mix. So among those who use their phone to go online, um, six in 10 Latinos and 43% of African Americans are cell mostly internet users compared with 27% of whites. Half of cell internet users between the ages of 18 to 29 mostly use their cell phones to go online. So this again skews young, skews non-white, but skews young. 45% um, of cell internet users with a high school diploma or less mostly use their phone to go online, compared with 21% of those with a college degree. So again, if you are looking at targeting a, a lower education population, mobile is gonna be very important. Um, and similarly, um, 45% of cell internet users living in households with an annual income of less than $30,000 a year mostly use their phone to go online, compared with 27% of those living in households with an annual income of 75% or more. Um, this is an area of, of particular interest, so um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time um, looking at the population um, that might be described as lower income, and so I wanted to define it for, for you. Um, we do national telephone surveys to collect our quantitative data. Um, just to, to make sure that you know that, that we're serious about the methodology, we do dual frame samples, so it's landline to cell. We survey in Spanish and English. Um, and um, we um, collect enough um, samples so that we're able to get down into some pretty um, granular categories in terms of income rates. Um, but there's some limitation in that not everyone tells us how much money they make on the phone. Um, and we can't necessarily subdivide these, um, these groups unless we're able to, to put a, um, a lot of sample together. Um, now the line across the top of this chart shows those who own a cell phone, and the bars show those who use the internet. So you can see um, down at the lower end of the income spectrum, the gap um, that I was just describing, people who are um, sell mostly internet users. Um, and uh, I just wanted to bring that out. And by the way, I'm gonna post these slides on um, pewinternet.org so you don't have to scribble down all the data. Um, it'll all be there and we publish everything for free in our data sets um, so, that, so that everyone can, can benefit. Um, now we're gonna talk today um, not just about text messaging, which, which everybody can do with a cell phone, um, but also about apps. Um, and so I wanted to bring out some data about smartphones. Um, so this shows the income rates um, for those who have a smartphone versus um, not. Um, and you can see that um, income makes a very significant difference when it comes to um, the penetration rate. Um, but look at the, there's still 34% um, of folks who are living in um, you know, the lowest income group who are making the decision to have that smartphone. Um, so it's important to keep an eye on that um, to see whether, whether and how that's going to grow. Age, however, um, really tells the story um, in an even more important way. Um, when you are talking about um, people in their late teens and 20s, um, if you were talking about a health intervention for that group, then you can be more confident that they're going to be able um, to do things um, that are far from smartphone only. Um, since we are also going to be talking about some international data, I wanted to bring forward um, some data that's from my colleagues at the Pew Research Center in the Global Attitudes Project. We survey in 60 countries, um, and this particular data about cell phones 
is based on surveys um, that were conducted in the US, um, Britain, France, Germany, Poland, Russia, Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, China, Pakistan, and New Mexico. Um, and again, all of the data from the Global Attitudes Project is published online for free. Um, so if, for example, you're dealing with either an international project or you're dealing with an immigrant population, you might look at our global data um, as a clue to where those folks are coming from and what the technology profile is in their country. Now, um, I wanted to um, talk about some of the activities. Um, the reason why I'm really interested in texting is because, again, it's, it's quite a common activity. Um, but it's interesting to look at all the other activities that um, are possible um, and to start to think about what people are using their phones for. <coughs> In the mobile health survey that we did, we asked people um, if they receive any text updates or alerts about health and medical issues. And at this point, um, this was a 20, September 2012 survey, it was just 9% of cell phone owners who say they receive any text updates or alerts about health or medical issues. Um, and you know, in some ways that really just shows the potential for growth, that, that this is not something that uh, many healthcare systems are taking advantage of yet. There are exceptions. Um, but um, if you look, um, you know, basically what I wanted to do today is show the penetration rate for all of this technology, show how much people are using this for non-health activities, um, and then show the gap, um, because there's still so much potential for growth in mobile health. Uh, we recently came out with um, an in-depth study about um, online videos. And um, I brought this today because there is evidence that people are watching um, online videos on their phones or on their tablets. And um, what was really interesting to me is that, of course, um, comedy videos dominate um, online and um, you know, music. And, and you, know, you can imagine what, is, what are the top um, things that people are looking at in terms of online video. But 50% of adults who are looking at online video are watching educational videos. Um, and that, that's an opportunity um, for health communication um, that is not just limited to a, the, the desktop or laptop population. That's something that, that we can really start to talk about in terms of um, mobile. Uh, it's especially powerful if you are looking at a low literacy population. Um, because you'll be able to send health education videos and, and those can be shared among a family. Um, and uh, it's, it's something to really remember and think about and remind your colleagues. The, um, this is data about what we call location-aware real-time information. And um, this is a study that we did to show how people are solving problems in real time, um, where they're able to, again, um, what percentage of smartphone versus cell owners uh, were able to get help in an emergency situation, that's pretty even, um, versus get up to the minute traffic or public trans transit information, that's more likely to be a smartphone owner. And the reason why I wanted to include this chart and these activities today is um, you can read this and, and join me as, as I do every day. I, I read what the Pew, my colleagues at the Pew Research Center are publishing, and I think of it, I filter it all through a health lens. Um, and so we can go through this and think about what is the equivalent um, for a healthcare activity. Um, because what we've seen in our research is that people start to, um, to wear out paths in, in certain activities that, that aren't necessarily health related. But then when they have a health crisis, when they come to a crossroads in terms of their healthcare decision making, they remember, right, when I had that decision about which car I was gonna buy, the internet was very useful to make that kind of um, information intensive, just in time decision. And people then turn to the internet to make those kinds of health decisions. So, so you know, how many people, I mean, healthcare, 
How do you solve an unexpected problem? That's something that is incredibly useful for mobile health and clearly incredibly useful for mobile health. 70% um, of cell phone owners said yes to any one of these um, activities. 86% of smartphone owners say, um, said yes to any of these activities, which means that they get real-time information on their phones. An example um, is if you haven't seen it yet, aids.gov maintains a widget right on the front page of their site, which is a, a clinic locator. Um, and you can actually pop that onto your own website. Um, and that is a location aware, um, real time um, ability to, if you decide at this moment that, that it's time to get tested, um, there is a place that you can go. Um, and it'll tell you exactly where to go. So again, you can think about all the applications. I love um, during the question and answer time to hear from people about what your ideas are. Um, and if you know of pilot programs, I'd, I'd love to always be adding to my examples. Um, I wanted to now turn to the research that, that I focused on, which is healthcare. And I'm gonna start by talking about one of um, the, to, to my mind, one of the most important groups in healthcare today, uh, and that is caregivers. These are family members who are taking care of a loved one. Um, and uh, we collected this data in September 2012 and asked a series of questions. They're standard questions to screen for caregivers. We never use the word caregivers um, because so many people don't think of themselves as caregivers. They just think of themselves as a dutiful daughter or you know, just, just being you know, a wife um, or really just being a mom. Um, we included not only questions about whether someone is taking care of an adult, uh, but also whether they're taking care of a child with significant health issues. Um, and what we found is that it's, um, it's a growing group. The last time we were in the field for these questions, 30% of US adults um, said that they are caregivers. Now it's 39%. That's the change from 2010 to 2012. Um, you know, sometimes the Pew Research Center, um, in, our, in our studies of the internet, we sometimes stumble on big demographic stories. And I think this is one. Um, where we are um, facing an aging population. We are facing um, a situation where uh, people's lives are being saved, but they're being sent home medically fragile. Um, and family members are being asked to take on um, roles that they are not prepared for. Um, and what our study shows is that people very often um, go online to try and get up to speed quickly on um, how to take care of their loved one. This is a list of activities that actually are both online and offline um, that um, we ask about in our um, survey and we were able to segment um, care caregivers versus non-caregivers. And um, what this chart and actually the whole caregivers report shows is that caregivers turn up the volume on every single information resource. Um, and speaking of open data, one of the questions on our survey was, um, have you hit a paywall in your pursuit of health information? Um, caregivers were very likely to say yes, and were very likely to say it didn't stop them. They um, found a way um, to get that information. And that, to me, speaks of the passion that people bring to their health. Um, and so, what that means, um, is often that they are, are using technology. They are very likely to have cell phones. They're likely to be using mobile devices. And um, they uh, are often the second degree internet access for people. Um, so as you think about whether a target population might be offline, uh, because you're talking about um, maybe one of our elders, um, or maybe we're talking about um, targeting a recent immigrant population. Um, think about whether um, that person might better be reached through a caregiver and making sure that the information and interventions that are available um, are ones that are able to be shared because that's what we're seeing in our data, that so much of health is social, both online and offline. The other group that um, 
actually is a this is a preview of a report that that we're writing now. Um, it's going to be coming out in early November, um, and that is focusing on a really important group, of course, in healthcare, and that is people who are living with chronic conditions. Um, this is the list of, of conditions that we ask about in, in the survey, and we find um, that about 20% of U.S. adults are living with one condition, 24% are living with two or more conditions, uh, for, and because there's a little bit of fudge factor in that 20% and 24%, it turns out to be 45% of U.S. adults are living with chronic conditions. These are the people we really need to reach. These are also the people who are less likely to be online, and they're less likely to have a cell phone. <coughs> the rates of cell phone um, ownership are, are really pretty high. Um, it, what we see, um, again, is that the, the, um, the, the ratio of, of people who have a cell phone or who are online um, basically has moved in concert all throughout the years that we've been tracking this. Everybody, everybody is, is moving up, um, but we still don't, there's still a gap between people who um, have a chronic condition and those who have no chronic condition. Um, which is, again, important to think about in terms of caregivers. But um, this is a group that um, also, once they are online, they are very likely to be turning up the volume on information resources. They're also very likely to be social about their health. Um, and what we've identified in our data is something that we're calling the diagnosis difference. It can have a negative effect where we isolate um, age, education, income, all the demographic factors that we see playing a role in technology adoption. Living with a chronic condition has a significantly independent negative effect when it comes to predicting whether someone has access to the internet. Um, but it has a significant independent positive effect that once they're online, they're more likely to seek health information and um, to engage in all sorts of um, technology pursuits around health. So on that note, um, we um, included a question in our 2012 survey about whether you've used your cell phone to look up health information. And so I wanted to bring out um, this idea in terms of um, cell phone ownership. With the caregivers, we see that they are more likely than non-caregivers to use their phones to look up health information. But those with the chronic conditions, this is one of the areas where they are less likely. So those with chronic conditions are more like, likely to maybe be um, using a computer um, and less likely to be using their cell phone, probably because they don't have smartphones, because um, that population is less likely to have a, a smartphone. I wanted to bring out two other groups, um, those who have faced a recent medical crisis and those who've experienced a significant health change in the last 12 months. Um, and they were more likely to be accessing health information on their phone. Um, and so what is the opportunity there for someone um, who is, in, you know, again, solving a real-time problem and going online using their phone to get that information? Um, and finally, um, this is our data on health apps. And I wanted to mark it that this is uh, 2012 data. Um, and what we find is that about one in five smartphone owners have a health app. And I decided to, to put up the um, chart about all the various different kinds of health apps that people have. This was an open-ended question, my favorite kind of survey question, um, because people can just tell us in their own words what kind of health app they have. And it's about what you'd expect, um, you know, just looking at the Android or iTunes market for health apps, you know, these are the popular things that people are looking for. Um, but then you go down the list and you see some, some kind of interesting outliers. Um, my favorite one um, is that there is a small group of men who have a menstrual cycle tracking app on their phone. Um, and when we identified that, um, I was working um, with uh, a younger colleague um, who, who came to my office and said, this can't be right. And I said, oh, honey. <laughs> yeah, it's right. Um, and you can think of lots of reasons why a man might have a menstrual cycle tracking app on their phone. Um, but let's just focus on fertility. Um, and, um, and, and this actually is a growing market. Um, if you look at you know, coverage of apps, this is, this is something that people are really interested in. And it's actually, again, solving a problem that people have 
If you are starting a family or would like to add to your family, don't go out of town on the day that your wife or partner is ovulating. Um, and that's what the menstrual cycle, the cycle tracking app can do. Um, so I wanted to, to circle back to what I talked about at the beginning, that um, what I see is that mobile, it was an earthquake um, that has now created new roads through areas that, that we thought we really couldn't pass through before. Um, it's going to be able to, it's, a, it's potentially going to be able to reach populations that were unreachable before. Um, and what we need to do is look for the pioneers. We need to find the locals who can help us find our way. And we also need to stay alert because the ground is going to continue to shift. Um, indeed, um, as MJ said, we've known each other since the beginning of the research that we've done. Um, and what I love is that my job just keeps changing. Um, the internet keeps changing and the possibilities keep growing um, more and more interesting. Um, and so I wanted to close by again saying all of our data um, is available online and uh, I would love to help you connect with any of it. If, if you can't find something, please, um, I'm always available by email and I especially love answering questions on Twitter. Thank you.